Hello again and welcome to the Master's Voice. I'm Celestial and you are welcome to this channel. To old and new subscribers alike, you are very welcome. Please follow the channel on one of the alternate platforms. That's Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can also find the Spanish language blog and channel that is called La Voz del Señor. And you can find all the information for that in the description box below. And the word that I have today may be titled a little strangely, but when I was seeking the Lord for the title, for the name that he would give it, the same two words kept coming back to me over and over again until I, I simply wrote them down. And the title of today's word is peanut butter, peanut butter. And I received this word on April the 11th, 2023. And none of these prophecies that I've been making today are on the blog. I've been receiving words back to back to back, and I just have not had time to update them on the blog. And so here is it. I had a dream today, and at first, not all of the dream was making sense. But when I woke up and the Lord began to open the dream to me, then it made sense. And so what I dreamt is that I had gone to a building. I do not know if it was a tall building or just one of those wide flat ones, but it was certain, certainly a building that took up a lot of space. And when I was in this building, I was looking for a certain room. So there was supposed to be an event at that building and I had arrived for my part in the event. So I was supposed to be part of the event. And as I was passing a certain part of the building, I saw a very large hall done up in red velvet and very comfortable seats lined up like a movie theater where this event would be held. Just a moment, please. So this event was going to be held in a very lavish theater that had seats done in velvet and it looked exactly like a movie theater. So I was passing that hall and I saw that quite a few people had arrived early to get good seats. So there, there were people processing them into this theater place, but that's not where I was supposed to be. I was looking for where I was supposed to be. I was looking for an organizer or someone who could tell me where I was supposed to be. And I heard a voice calling and it said, Celestial, go into that room. So I was standing right in front of a door and the voice said, Celestial, yes, that room, the room that you're in front of right now, that's where the others are waiting. So you just go in there and we'll get you when we need you. So I put my hand out and I was about to enter the door. The way that the Lord showed me this was very strange. And so I'm just going to say it the way that I saw it. At first I saw myself stepping into the room. So I stepped into this room and it was a pastor's lounge and it was a very simple pastor's lounge. It was decently done. It had couches, it had chairs, it had one big conference table. And at that conference table, there was an older man sitting there and he was going over two sets of papers in front of him. And there were two other men in there. All of the men in this room were pastors. All of the men in this room were older than me. And the one who was sitting at the table was significantly older. His beard had already turned white and the suit that he was wearing was a simple black plaid in a style that men don't usually wear anymore. It's, it's a very old style that he was wearing. And so when I came into the room immediately, none of the men acknowledged me and none of the men said anything to me. None of the men were speaking to each other. And so that is what happened. When I came into the room, I was having a vision. Just a moment, please. So when I stepped into the room, I was already having a vision. And so that's why um, it was a little disconcerting to me. When, when you are in real life and the Lord begins to show you a vision, that vision is in front of your eyes, showing you sometimes just a frozen picture. The Lord can just show you one thing. But as he often does with me, the Lord is showing me an entirely new vista. So I'm watching a different movie. And at the same time, if I'm outside on the street, I'm seeing cars go by, I'm seeing people go by. So real life is happening, but a totally different thing is happening in front of your eyes at the same time. And it can be very disconcerting. Another level of confusion, I might say, even though it is not confusion, can be added when you are outside seeing real life with your natural eyes, and then you're seeing a vision with your spiritual eyes, and then the Lord is talking to you and explaining to you the spiritual thing that you are seeing. And so I was seeing two realities. 
the vision. I was hearing the Lord's voice explain the vision, and I was seeing real life, and this is what I saw. As I turned towards the door that the voice had told me, Celestial, that door, go into that room and we'll come and get you when we're ready. Through the door, as I was about to put my hand on the handle, I saw the greatness of America's pastoral lineage. And when I say America's greatness, I am talking about her greatness in the lineage of pastors that she has brought through. I saw a who's who of the known, the well-known, the super well-known, and the greats. Whoever you want to think about, that person was in there. And so I saw these people packed in there, talking loudly. And I must say, when I say that people are laughing because they're fulfilled, they're well taken care of, they're happy, there's this laugh that they laugh where they throw their head back and you can see all the dental work that they've had done, whether they've had crowns put in in gold or silver. You can see that. That is what I was seeing. People laughing uproariously at one another's jokes and saying it's been such a long time since I've seen you and they were just greeting each other. I saw a lot of expensive jewelry through that door. So I'm talking about expensive ring rings, signet rings. This is rings with particular motifs that have been carved on them to show that the person is with this group or that group, maybe Kappa Phi or Sigma, whatever. It was like that. I was seeing many expensive watches. You name it, the watch was in that room. I was seeing gold chains. I was seeing earrings and necklaces and accessories. And the inside of the room, as I saw it through the door, looked very different from the inside of the room when I actually walked into the door and I saw a lot of women that were just wrapped up so tight in this dress that I have expressed before irritates me a lot. All the weather women here in America wear it. That famous wraparound bandage dress that Kim Kardashian has made so famous. I saw that even older ladies who should know better because their figures are not flattered by that kind of dress were wearing that dress. And then they were trying to camouflage the clingy nature of the dress and its revealing nature by sometimes putting a scarf across the front or they were throwing, there's something that women throw on the shoulder. The word escapes me now. They would throw that there and then they would let it hang in front to try and downplay how clingy this dress were, was. And these were women who had come to a pastoral lounge and so I saw tons of mile high pointy heels, clouds of perfume in the room, and the room was full. Meanwhile, I'm still standing outside the door. I'm standing outside the door. And then on the table, I saw only two meals, bread and cake, and not many varieties of both. So there's tons of different types of bread and there's tons of different types of cakes. Everything on the table seemed to be made of the whole hearty um, brown variety. So made with either whole brown flour or millet flour or the more thick granular flour that you get the much more healthy bread from. So it was only bread, brown bread and brown cake, brown, brown pound cake and ginger spice cake. And the kind of cake that when you bake it, it comes out brown and it looks like a loaf of bread. And I also saw many different varieties of brown bread. And the guests were eating this stuff and could not get enough of it. They were eating so much of the brown bread and the brown cake. And when I saw the vision, I thought that that's what was happening in the room. And I thought to myself, it would be very nice to have a slice of brown bread and maybe a slice of ginger cake. And I think I may ask for some tea as well while I wait. And then I took a deep breath and I said, well, I'm here now. I belong here. I was invited to come here and I was told to come and be in the pastor's lounge. I belong here. God put me here and here I am. And then I open the door and what is in front of me is completely different from what I saw through the door. All I see is a room that looks like a little lobby in a modest two-star hotel, nothing fancy. Not a single one of the shiny people that I was seeing through the door was actually in that room. It was not a fantastic lounge that had amazing leather couches and, and comfort like I had seen. Everything was gone. 
the food table was gone and there were just three male pastors that were sitting on very different furniture from what I had seen in the vision. There was no food and the three men in this room were not even talking to one another. And then as I was standing there in my vision, the famous people, the well-known, the who's who, America's great pastoral lineage, they all disappeared and cleaners came in and there was only a little bit of brown bread left on the table and a little bit of those brown spiced cakes left on the table. But in my world, there was no food table and there was nothing. And I was watching sadly in this vision as the cleaners cut the last of the bread and the last of the cake among themselves. They ate it, they cleaned the room and they left. And as I was watching the last of this bread and the last of the cake be eaten, I felt a very strange pain inside me that I did not understand. And that was the pain that I felt I was being denied something that I should have had a part of. Now to real life. In real life, two of the pastors were sitting and they were riveted to TV and social media. So there were three pastors. One is sitting by himself at a conference table and he has two rows of documents in front of him and he's working between the two. On the other side, in one chair, a man sits watching a very large TV and another man is watching on his cell phone. So one is watching social media and the other one is watching TV. And these two men were a little bit happy. So the feeling that was coming off them is happiness, gleefulness, and I'll explain why. Both of them were watching on TV and social media as scandal after scandal after scandal of pastors, evangelists, prophets, and other religious leaders in Christianity around the world were being exposed, and the majority of the exposés was sex crimes, sex sins, and sexual immoralities. The greatest number of the exposés were taking place here in the United States. And I stood there and because the TV was bigger, I was watching what was on TV and it almost looked as if I was watching a TV dedicated exclusively to exposing and embarrassing pastors, a pastor scandal breaking news channel. I saw pastors being arrested completely naked, totally naked men that were in handcuffs in front of the media. And maybe a few of them had these FBI people on the sides of them and the FBI people would be explaining what this pastor's crime was, what the pastor had done. And because the hands were cuffed in front of him, the man usually chose to keep the hands down in front of him to try and preserve some kind of modesty. But the camera was, camera was panning around these men, showing their entire nakedness to the whole world. And the FBI people were not even moved a little bit. They were standing there and they were like, yes, you know, this is so-and-so and we've indicted him on crimes of this and this and that. And he's been involved with children and we're going to prosecute these crimes to the full extent of the law. And the media was there clicking, clicking away. And then the scene would click and another person would be standing there, some of them with their clothes, and they were being indicted for stealing money. They were being indicted for embezzlement. They were being indicted for all kinds of things. Pastors even being indicted for murder. But the great and vast majority of these crimes were to do with sex sins. And some of them, even the naked ones, please listen, naked in front of the whole world were still protesting that it was all a mistake. They were saying, no, this is all a mistake. You don't understand. And they were trying to make excuses and defend themselves to the press. So at least they could get their five minute explanation out on the airwaves. But most of these people knew that they were busted. And so they kept quiet as they went to the police crimes. And as I looked at this, I had this very flat and dead feeling inside of me as pastors sex tapes. Please listen, because I prophesied this in 2022, that God said that sex tapes of the people that you love out there, the ones that you think are untouchable and they're men of God, he said those sex tapes will be on the phone of even a little 12-year-old. The 12-year-old wants to follow the story on Twitter. So be it. 
all the pastor's business will be out and those tapes will not be suppressed by the social media place. They will go zipping to phones around the world and you will find out who these people that you constantly defend and venerate are. When they come out with their first, second, and third scandal, you're right there to wipe their lips and say, Pastor, we love you and we're with you, meaning that we cover your sin with our own righteousness as filthy rags, and we exonerate you before the Lord with our acceptance of you, and we will go all around the multiverse clicking and saying, you don't understand And aren't we all human? And we must be careful not to judge. God sees you as you do this. And Romans chapter 1 and verse 32 is waiting to judge your eternal soul if you continue to do this and you do not repent. God was showing on the TV, which was larger than that other pastor's cell phone, that pastor's sex tapes will be played out in public. And on TV, all they simply said is, Viewer discretion is advised, but on social media, the uncut version was freely available. So on TV, they were putting privacy dots, just wanting you to see the person's face. This is how R. Kelly was caught, I believe. But on social media, the raw footage was flying between devices, laptops, and phones. And it was just steady, rolling, continuous footage And both of the pastors watching had this kind of gleefulness. So a part of them were like children thinking, is this real? Is this actually happening? But at the same time, they were trying to keep themselves in check. Inside their hearts, God was showing me that these men were happy to see these false pastors and these filthy liars who stand in position of such high authority. And they carry so much weight in the spiritual atmosphere and they command so much respect and people are out there respecting what God cannot respect. These pastors were happy and in their heart was something like this. Finally, finally, yes, yes, it's finally happening. There is justice. But this third pastor who was older paid no attention to anything that was happening. He was working on his sermon And that was one row of notes. And he was working on his church accounts. At the same time, he was taking meticulous notes of both. He was doing meticulous checks on both. And he did not look up at any of us. I turned back to the TV as the news, as a new segment featuring a naked black pastor came on. And then I suddenly heard, young lady, if you're going to smoke in here, you can't be here. You cannot smoke in this room. And I was startled and I turned to the older man and I said, sir, and he repeated himself, if you're going to smoke in here, you can't be here. You cannot smoke in this room. And I said, sir, I don't smoke. I am not smoking in here. And he seemed puzzled and was for the first time that he seemed to join the rest of us in at least this world because he was so wrapped up in his own world of preparing a true sermon and making sure that he was keeping his church's financial books in order. And he said, but there's a smell of cigarettes in here. And I felt sorry for this older man. I said to him, sir, this lounge has smelled of cigarettes for a good long time. The smell of cigarettes was the first thing that I noticed when I got in here. This scent has always been here. You only noticed it now. And then he nodded thoughtfully and he went back to his work. And what this part means is that in the bygone era, when the famous of the famous and the top of the top used to gather at these conferences where they call them to come together, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and and Christians see the lineup and they go crazy, spending hundreds of dollars, thousands upon thousands in aggregate to go and hear the word of the Lord because so-and-so will be ministering and so-and-so and so-and-so and and there's going to be these three prophetic voices and these two anointed um, psalmists. I can't wait. These people used to gather back there and this is what they used to receive. They used to receive the pure, well-baked, non-fluffy word of God, good, solid brown bread, good, solid brown cake, good for the body, to strengthen the believer, to strengthen the pastor, who is then supposed to strengthen God's people. Just a moment, please, because of noise. 
I will just continue. They received good food from God. God laid a table for those who came before. He fed them the true word. He gave them solid food that should have built them up as good and righteous holy leaders. And he gave them what they could feed on and feast on. The way prophet Elijah received bread and the Bible said that he went three days and three nights in the food that he had received prepared by the hand of an angel. God gave them good, solid food and fed them so that they could feed his people. But in those pastoral lounges at the back where nobody saw, they indulged in wealth. They indulged in camaraderie. They indulged in endorsing one another, something that still happens here in America. All the false prophets are friends and they all endorse one another because they want to keep the people in a net, a whirlpool of deception and captivity until the day that the anger of the Lord breaks out against this nation and judges them. And then they will say in shock, what is our crime? And God, the Lord will say, you did not love the true word. You favored lies. And by these lies, you have now been captured and snared. So I told this old man, the scent of the previous sins have been in this room. The days of opulence are passed away now. And the ones responsible for it have been removed now because God will remove these people. I already spoke of it at length last year in the middle of the year. God will remove them. He will uproot them. He will put a hook in their jaws and some of them will be taken away suddenly the Lord says that pastors will drop dead in the pulpit when he judges them suddenly for lies, for misleading the people, for misrepresenting his name to the church. And I said that when you start to see the pastors being taken away, you must know church that you are next. And so I noticed that there was a seat at the end of the conference table and there was just a single jar of peanut butter sitting there at that seat in front of a chair that had been prepared for me. Just one chair sitting by itself with peanut butter sitting in front of it. And I went to that chair and I sat down and inside my heart I knew this is my food. This is what God has for me. I do not get bread and I do not get cake. I get peanut butter, which is very difficult to chew on. I get peanut butter, which if you put too much of it, even into the mouth of a child or an animal or an adult, that person will choke. And so I took the lid off the peanut butter and I took two massive spoonfuls and I put them on a small side plate and I started eating the food that God thinks is good for me while I was waiting for this event to start and to do whatever it is that had come to that place to do. And so you come to this channel and you can't accept the word that God has given me because there's too much distress and there's too much lamentation and there's too much woe in it and it's too heavy and there's too much death and there's not enough hope and where's the grace? And where's the mercy? And God doesn't sound like this. And the reason this channel is the way it is is because there is no cake for celestial. There is no bread. These are end times matter. The peanut butter that will choke the nations. God has called me to speak to nations. And yet people in this nation largely cannot perceive. What form of person is it that God has said, address the Muslims in my name, that God has said, Address the continent of Africa in my name. Speak to those in Korea and Japan and remonstrate with them and rebuke them in my name and tell them, where is my sacrifice? Why do you tie your prayers onto trees and think that the wind blowing through the trees is how your prayers will be carried to God? Why do you go to the edge of cliffs after tsunamis and water disasters and throw flowers into the sea and say that you are appeasing the gods of the water? What kind of person is this whom the Lord has called to arrest kings by their name, to speak to them by their name and tell them your life will be required by my God? People look and they do not perceive.
God has not given me bread. God has not given me croissants. God has not given me cake. It is the end of times. And God has given me what will choke the nations. And the reason that I can eat my food is because the scripture says that God spoke and said, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. And people thought that God meant he would fill it with cake and fill it with bread. These are the end times and God is filling my mouth with peanut butter. And I have come to bring peanut butter to the nations. And whoever opens their throat wide, not to speak and rebuke me, God will help you to swallow this peanut butter. That is all from this message that God has given me. That end times judgments against false pastors and false prophets and those who are sleeping with the church members and those who are touching on the children in the various Jesuit Catholic camps, in the various churches around the world, pastors whom the Lord revealed last year's celestial, these people kill animals and they plant the animals under the altar in the churches. Never heard of this before, that they will slaughter an animal and they will plant it under the church. And then they will say that as the maggots multiply in the body beneath the pulpit, so will the people mag multiply inside my house. And then what you see happening in real life is people cannot stay away from that ministry. The ministry begins to trend like nobody's business, but the people do not know that there is a defiled covenant, a defiled spiritual wickedness with evil powers taking place beneath, taking place beneath the pulpit to capture their souls and kill them. The Lord revealing that some of these pastors make covenants with beings under the sea and that they tithe their members' blood to these beings. So a few accidents here and there, a few car accidents and a few strokes and heart attacks, nothing that people will notice. Illuminati pastors here in the United States, God naming them and their acolytes whose eyes are dipped in filth and who cannot see anything. What are your reasons for naming this person? Did God really speak to you? And, and, and have you prayed for them? As if the Lord called me to pray for defilement. The Lord rejects something and say that he will judge it, but you want to go. Even those who come here, TB Joshua mind slaves. God has struck him out of the earth because the Lord says he is corrupted and defiled. That he was working with the principality of the dragon. The dragon, the most deadly of them all. Satan himself. God struck him out of life. But the women who love him still come here weeping for Tammuz. She's talking about TB Joshua. What, what is she saying? I hope she will explain. The idols are judged and people go to the grave of what God has rejected and continue to weep and mourn for them. These pastors will not be arrested and made naked in the street. What God is showing is that we will hear so much about what they had done that it will be as if they were naked to the skin in front of us. This is a civilized society. No one's going to bring a pastor actually outside naked and the cops stand there with him naked. The way that the woman who was caught in adultery came out naked and they dragged her with no covering before Jesus trying to trap him and get him to condemn her. Their sins will be brought out in such detail that God has said we will grow sick. He said we will go sick in the belly. And that sickness will be having to realize how much you loved filth and how much you defended the filth until God finally had to bring the filth out on TV and show you the crying victims that your filth had touched. And woe unto you when you see those things and you open your mouth to still make an excuse for those people. There may be some people in other jurisdictions where the pastor will be caught with someone's wife and dragged out naked, because in other cultures they do that. They will drag you out naked from the house. An angry husband will drag you out naked in front of the whole village 
to expose this is your man of God. Perhaps a husband who doesn't go to the church, but his wife goes and his wife is addicted to going because the pastor is her second husband, her covering father. A husband's wrath is not easily appeased. He will drag that man into the town square and everyone will have the cell phone out in these places where they do that. Uploading it to the cloud, to Facebook and Twitter. They use these things in other countries as well. The shame of the known, the well-known, the super well-known, the who's who, even if they have retired, even if they have died, like Ravi Zacharias, will come out and woe to you, church, if you still dare to try to defend it. God will deal with you very strongly when victim testimony comes out and you try to mute those victims, go and watch the prophecy called the end of the way of the wicked. God says that when these rapes come out, these sexual molestation testimonies begin to come out, whether it's in the church or outside, woe to you that tries to make the victim small. Woe to you that tries to make the victim quiet. Woe to you when you hear that people have been hurt sexually that people in positions of power, people in positions of leadership have abused the power, abused the influence, abused the leadership. And the victim finally finds the courage to come out and then you begin to call it a money grab. They're confessing because they want a money grab from the Hollywood star. They're confessing because they want a money grab from the politician, from the pastor that you have pinned up on the wall of your mind. You are deceived. Woe unto you who do this who know that those who commit sins against the innocent, the vulnerable, and those who trust them because they are leaders. They offend against God in what they are doing. They offend against God by standing in the pulpit and having sexual scandal after sexual scandal come out, and then they come and they weep fake fat tears in front of you, and then you give them absolvement. You absolve them of the crime. You tell them it's okay, pastor. We all stumble. I myself don't judge you. One of the things that the Lord said in that prophecy, the end of the way of the wicked, the Lord said, you that excuses the adultery of the pastor, when adultery comes to your 17 year marriage, you better not say a word to your wife who is easing her needs with the 25 year old tutor that she got to teach your children. You better not condemn her. You bet her, show her the same loving acceptance that you are willing to extend to pastors who desecrate their robes and bring the name of Jesus Christ into befiled, defiled, befoulment and disrepute that cause those who are outside of the faith to curse our God because his people can't keep their clothes on. Woe to you. The way you love the pastor's sin, you better love your husband's sin, sin when he cheats. You better not condemn your child when they are caught in immorality because you defended the immorality of the pastors. This is the end of the prophecy that is called peanut butter. God has taken away the soft food and all that is left now is repentance and prophetic messages that choke. I am celestial and this is the master's voice. God bless those who have hearing ears. If you are running well in the faith, you must know that God is proud of you. If you are standing on the wall as a true watchman, you must know that God is encouraging you. If you are the only one in your family who accepts the word of God, whether you get it from here or from your own prayer time, you should not feel discouraged. You should know that in the last days, the mockers and scoffers are going to outnumber us. If they did not outnumber us, where do you think marchers would come from? If the church was going to be flying her glorious banners here on earth, where do you think persecuted of the persecution of the church and tribulation for the saints would come from? It will come from those who do not love the Lord, who will point every ill and say, it's the Christians, it's the Christians, it's the Christians who are responsible for this. 
persecution and martyrdom are part of our story while we yet tarry and linger here. Peanut butter. What is hard to eat and what you need a very large throat and capacity for if you are going to get it down without choking. God bless you and until I see you again, goodbye.